Hello again. Welcome to another installment of Bioinformatics. Today I'm going to be starting on a series of short lectures discussing uncertainty and information content and how we use those to find patterns, biological patterns in large data sets. So without further ado, let's get started. The slides again are on Google Drive, talking patterns in data with an aim towards identifying motifs. So part one of this talks about the consensus sequence, which if you've not heard of, I'm sure you've at least seen uh, consensus sequences in your uh, trip through biology. <clears throat> so first to wrap up, we had discussed simple pattern matching, regular expressions. I call this simple, although the language can be quite complex. The approach is somewhat simple compared to what we need. It's very useful. It's quick and easy to code, very easy. It's somewhat flexible, very powerful text searching. Extremely good at finding patterns, similarities, not so much. It's not really designed for that. And it doesn't deal well with noise. And in biology, as you are aware of by now, we deal with a lot of noise, looking for signal amongst the noise. So patterns in biology, often noisy, often subtle. This is because they arise via random events, random mutation followed by selection. So there is no one direct path from A to B. There is random mutation followed by selection in a particular direction. And so the data that we have are noisy. The patterns we are looking for are often it's fairly subtle and we need more powerful tools to find these. In addition, we often think about patterns at the sequence level, but they can occur at different organizational schemes as well. We often see structural conservation or even conservation of shape. These are all important things, important patterns that we need to identify to understand our biological data. So we turn to more powerful pattern matching methods to find these hidden Markov models also called HMMs or support vector machines or SVMs are two of many pattern matching methods. This is not to downplay the usefulness of regular expressions, especially in processing our data. <clears throat> With that in mind, I have activity 19 posted on eCampus for you. Pattern matching, having a little fun with FASTA files. So there is a file called activity19.faa, that is in the supplements folder on Google Drive. For this activity, download that file or copy it to your desktop, then launch a terminal and CD to your desktop. For part A, I want you to write a single grep command to count the number of FASTA entries in this file. To do this, remember what it means to be a FASTA entry. There is really only one item in a FASTA entry that you can rely on being there every time, all the time. Think about that when you're writing your egrep command. Part B, think back to when we talked about pipelining, that pipe symbol, or vertical bar if you prefer. Recall how that works. We take one command, feed it something on standard in, process that with the command, it feeds its output to standard out, we can capture that standard out using the pipe command and send it directly into another command. Okay, so part B, I want you to write a pipeline that uses egrep to count the number of sequences in that FASTA file that begin with M. And as a hint, look up what the dash A argument to egrep does. That's on the last slide deck, dash A argument. Another hint, part B builds upon part A. And finally, part C, modify your pipeline in B to count sequences that start with any amino acid except for M. Take note that your results from these three steps, A, B, and C, should be related to each other. So A counts the total number of entries, B counts the number of entries that start with M, 
and C counts the number of entries that don't start with F. So as a sanity check, A minus B should equal to C. Okay, submit each command and its output as activity 19 to eCampus. Again, you can copy paste from the terminal window, which is easiest, or you can take a screenshot, whichever works. And as always, get in touch with me if you have any questions. Okay, quick review. We're gonna jump back and look at multiple sequence alignments. In particular, we're going to look at how we use those in predicting or discovering sequence motifs. What is a sequence motif? A sequence motif is simply a recurring pattern that because it recurs, it is presumed to have a biological function. We have all sorts of examples of motifs at both the nucleotide and the protein level. I've listed just a few here, promoters, enhancers, start sites, terminators. Protein motifs include things like DNA binding sites, enzyme active sites, pockets for cofactors, signal peptides, functional domains of other sorts. So there are a lot of different motifs, different recurring patterns with biological functions that we wanna discover in our proteins or our DNA sequences. And again, just as a reminder, we care about these because patterns in biology implies conservation. Conservation implies importance and importance implies function. Okay, here's a simple example. We'll frame it first in terms of a regular expression and then move on from there. There is a, an outbreak of a staph infection, new staph outbreak. One of the things that we look at or could potentially look at in Staphylococcus is the presence of this hexapeptide sequence called an HPS domain. And you can read this abstract from a by now a very old paper, 1990, talking about these HPS domains. It's a highly conserved hexapeptide sequence, six peptides, <clears throat> conserved at both the protein and DNA level in the C-terminal end of all 11 known surface proteins from gram-positive carbon. So it gives a consensus sequence. Let's look at it in more detail down here. Here is the motif represented as a consensus sequence. We'll talk about consensus in a minute. LP, remember this is amino acids, so leucine, proline, X, TGE. The X here stands for anything. Anything can go there. Followed by nine amino acids, approximately, followed by a hydrophobic region. So our motif might look like this. In a regular expression pattern, if we were to search sequences, we might encode it looking something like this. Here's L, here's P, followed by anything, any one thing, and exactly one thing, that's the dot, followed by one in braces, followed by a T, a G, and an E. We might also encode it a little more specifically and say it has to be a character from A to Z, one and only one again. And we could modify this variable part in purple to be even more specific. Just limit it to amino acid letters if we wanted. That's about as far as a regular expression can get us. Okay, so here is our consensus sequence. And a consensus sequence is a sequence single sequence that comprised, comprised of the most abundant element at each position. So remember each column in a multiple sequence alignment is also called a position. On the left here we have example one, our hexapeptide motif from staph. Here are six genomes, six taxa if you will. Here is the domain in each of those taxa. Here is the consensus sequence. 
So again, to find a true consensus sequence, we simply identify the residue or the element that's most abundant at each position. And here in blue, I've colored the ones that are invariant. Those are easy to identify. Always an L, always a P, always a T, G, and E. In the middle here is our variable site. In a true consensus sequence, we would assign this an N because two of our taxa have an N there and every other taxa has one example of a different residue. So the most abundant residue at this position is N and we would put an N in our consensus. Another way to write it is what we saw initially, LPX, TGE. So as a human looking at this with a somewhat potentially more um, intelligent view, or at least nuanced view, we might look at this position here in our alignment and say, well, that's N, but really not sure that N is truly what we need here. Right? In this consensus, we would be looking for just the N. But instead, it seems like that's very variable. All of these taxa have a different residue. And so we could replace that with an X. Okay, some of the problems with representing this motif, even this well-conserved one, as a consensus sequence. The consensus sequence is a trade-off between simplicity, this is very simple and intuitive, and ambiguity. If we put an N here and we don't have this matrix of multiple sequences aligned to draw on, but we just have this consensus sequence, we lose all of this information by encoding it as an X. Even encoding it as an X, we lose any information that we might have here and simply throw up our hands and say anything can be there. Another drawback to a consensus sequence is it reflects the input data only. And as we've just seen, it's highly susceptible to bias. If we added four, five, six more taxa, and we found that there are actually more Vs than Ns, our consensus sequence would change. If we added 200 more taxa, and we find most of them have a Q there, again, our consensus would be different. In addition, a consensus sequence is often a supervised technique. We would take this LPN TGE and tweak it based on our human observation here. That yes, N is the most abundant, but it doesn't win by very much. Okay, so a consensus sequence can be useful, but we have to recognize where it fails. So let's think about a more informative way to represent our consensus sequence or to represent our motif than a consensus sequence. And to do that, let's think about this in terms of a matrix. What we're going to introduce in the next two or three slides is the concept of a matrix. You will see various flavors of matrices position-specific, position-frequency, position-specific scoring matrix. <clears throat> These abbreviations are fairly common. You will see them on BLAST <clears throat> if you run any kind of matrix-based BLASTs. They all derive from essentially the same thing, and that is a matrix or a grid composed of all possible elements at each position of our alignment. What does that mean? Well, let's build one and see. So here's our hexapeptide motif, just a very short, small alignment that I've pulled out. We have six positions. Position one is an L, a P, an N, a T, a G, and E. Six positions in this alignment. We take each of those positions here along the top, 
are our positions, and we count up at each position how many of a particular residue we have, how many elements are present in this position. So for example, in position one, all six of our sequences have an L. There are one, two, three, four, five, six. Six taxa have an L, so we put a count of six there. No taxa has any other amino acid. Now I've restricted this to be just amino acids that we see in our alignment. Okay, so there are no tyrosines in any of these alignments, so that tyrosine, Y, does not appear in our count grid at all. It's assumed to be zero across the board. This lets us simplify our count matrix. We don't have to include all 20 amino acids. You do the same count for position two. Again, we have six taxa with a proline there, so we have a six. Position three, which is our variable position, we have one E, one K, two Ns, one Q, and one B, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we have what is a simple count matrix. We can then convert that count matrix into a frequency matrix, a position-specific frequency matrix. What is the frequency of leucines in position one of our alignment? It's one. How do we get these frequencies? We simply divide the counts by the total number of taxa. All of our taxa have an L in position one. Six counts divided by six taxa is one. Same for position two, four, five, and six. It's only in position three that we see some different frequencies. <clears throat> Here we have one taxa with an E, so it's one divided by six or 0.17. One taxa with a K, two with an N, one with a Q, one with a B. So we've simply converted our count matrix into a frequency matrix. This frequency matrix gives us more information about our multiple sequence alignment, and hence about our motif. We can visualize that frequency matrix a little more human intuitive way, like this. This is called a web logo. You can still do these on weblogo.berkeley.edu. Here we're showing each position along the horizontal and the frequency of that position or that amino acid in that position along the vertical. Here's frequency from zero to one. And this is our hexapeptide motif as a web logo or a sequence logo. So L and P, T and G and E, those letters are large, indicating that they are found very often at this position. In fact, they are the only ones found in this position. Position three, we have a number of amino acids here. The N is slightly larger than either the E, K, Q, or V, indicating that N is more abundant there. But in fact, we see a lot of variability at this site. So a sequence logo based on a position specific frequency matrix gives us much more information about this matrix. Okay. In the next set of lectures, we're going to talk about how we use this information, this frequency matrix information, to build search engines to look for patterns in data. So we're going to go away from visualizing it for human use and into using it in a bioinformatics context. Thank you, and we will see you at the next one.